What's going on, everyone, and welcome back to the Midwest Outdoors podcast brought to you by Fish Daddy. As always, I'm your host, Jim O'Neill, and hey, welcome back, everyone. It's been an unusual spring, you know, kind of like it took off from winter. We didn't have a whole lot of ice this winter, and now we got a whole lot of weather this spring, but pretty normal, you know? But hey, this podcast, we're not going to be talking about weather. We're not even going to be talking about hunting. We're barely going to be talking about any other fish. This is the Bass Fishing Special. Something near and dear to my heart, and I know a lot of you guys pay attention. Um, Yeah, we're going to get right into it because we have two awesome guests today. One professional angler from the Midwest, from near my hometown, and, you know, there's only so many fishermen that you get to talk to and interact with that are not only from your area, but have competed at the highest level. And our other guest might know a little something about winning high-end tournaments. After all, he is a Bass Master Classic champ. So we're going to get into all of that. But hey, let's talk about those bass real quick because you guys probably want to catch some. Right now, here in Chicagoland area, we got the big lake, Lake Michigan, uh, in the mid-50s. So those smallmouth are starting to spawn now. And we got about mid-60s in most of our local, smaller inland bodies of water which are making the largemouth spawn. So right in the middle of the Midwest, those fish are spawning. So that means, you know, you go a little further north, pre-spawn, you go really far north towards the border, those fish are just now coming out of their winter stage, starting to swim around, starting to feed again. Now go down south, just talk to a couple individuals down in Kentucky Lake. Those fish are already in the bushes. Most of them are fry guarding. Sometimes you can find a fish on a bed still south, but for the most part, You get south of central Illinois, those fish are spawned out or just finishing it up. Right here in the middle of the Midwest, those fish are just now getting on the spawn. And to the north, we got our pre-spawn. So a lot of things going on right now. Um, You know, your spring classic baits are perfect to use right now. Your Ned rigs, your jigs, but you also might want to cover some water. Those places where those fish aren't spawning or starting to move again post-spawn your rattle traps, your chatter bait, your spinner bait. So get your favorite bass bait out, get out and hit the water because now is an amazing time to truly catch a giant. Now, besides us catching fish, the pros have been at it catching more fish. So the Elite Series is back up this coming weekend on Lake Murray. So we're looking forward to see who wins that. So if you're in fantasy fishing, make sure to set your lineup. MLF just had one of their stage events complete this weekend, and Zach Burge had a big win, about 15 pound win. These winners keep blowing everyone else out of the water, so hey, they're finding what they're eating. This week it was um, a bladed jig, an inline bladed jig, and you know, took the win. Uh, Speaking of the MLF, you know, right now number one and two is Jacob Wheeler having another unbelievable year. And number two, Elton Jones Jr. The reason I'm bringing that up is the brand new world bass rankings just came out this week. And those two, Jacob Wheeler and Elton Jones Jr. found themselves number one and number two, like they are currently in the point standing. So kind of something fun to watch right there. You know, this upcoming week in the Midwest here is the Bass Nation qualifier. So this is one of those events where your weekend warrior, your your average bass fisherman that fishes tournaments that can try to compete for a spot in the Bass Master Classic. So that's going on in La Crosse, Wisconsin, right here on the Mississippi River. So looking forward to that. Also to wrap up the bass thing, um, Bass Master right now for the high school level, it just opened up just opened up registration for the high school event. Um, We had Joe McNamara, he won last year. We had him on the show talking about the combine and all the things they do. It's not a tournament, it's a skills competition. So, hey, if you're a high school angler and you've got the skills and you wanna show it off and maybe get some college scholarship money, go sign up for the combine event through Bassmaster. It's certainly something cool to be a part of. Speaking of lacrosse, Wisconsin, you know, a few weeks ago, we had polls out from Wisconsin. And one of the things they wanted to know is if you wanted to ban live scope or not. Now, personally, I thought it was going to be an overwhelming landslide that there was no ban wanted. However, we just got the results back. And in fact, the ban was voted for, yes, ban live scope. It was a slim margin. But 
obviously we do not all think alike, and the Wisconsin anglers seem to be threatened possibly by this. So, you know, something I want to do is talk to some of these fishermen in the state and see what their opinion is. Now, just so we all are clear, this doesn't mean there's going to be a ban of live scope, but people's opinion matter, especially if they get to vote on a topic. So this was just a public poll, but I'm very curious to see where this leads in the future. Now, we do have a record to report on. This is the only non-bass thing for the day. Those paddlefish, those prehistoric monsters, well, we've got a true monster. And that was a 164 pound spoonbill or paddlefish, whatever you want to call it, um, was snagged, right? So that's usually how they're caught. It is legal to snag these fish for a certain time of year. But 164 pounds now beat the world record that was caught out of Oklahoma. And this one broke the state record by over 24 pounds down in Missouri. Unbelievable fish. You'll see in the picture, it holds, it took a team to hold this fish up. And for the average adult fish that's normally snagged, being between, you know, 50 and 80 pounds, to see one more than double that size is truly remarkable. And this was snagged in March during the open seasons, not now, but we finally got the confirmation that it's going to be a state and world record. So very, very cool. Now, we're going to jump to a quick commercial break, but we come back, we're gonna have our friend and Bassmaster Classic champ, Gussie, join us. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com. Alright everyone, we are back and we are joined by last year's Bassmaster Classic champion, the King of the North. What's going on, Gussie? How are you? Uh, I'm pretty good. We're uh I'm down in Florida right now, and uh we are on an off day just getting ready for the Harris Chain Elite Series event. So um yeah, been on the road. I, I missed a, a good chunk of ice fishing season this year. I, I ended up coming down here at the end of January, and I and I didn't go back. I was sort of planning to go back last week, and I ended up getting in a, in a tournament on Lake Lanier, one of my favorite lakes down south, and uh, spent my my time there. My wife went home and did a check-in on the house and took care of our tax stuff and all that. But uh, so, yeah, I'm down here till, um, till end of May, and uh after we have a tournament in south carolina and then i'll get get to go home after that so i'm timing it pretty good i'm gonna get home to like some killer fishing and um you know the good time of year up at lake of the woods see that's why you can't always believe everything you see on social media because i loved the picture i saw today of you with multiple different species and those were not florida fish no, those were, um, yeah, that was from a post from Lake of the Woods Sports Headquarters. We have a really, it's a really good tackle store in our hometown. And uh, yeah, that was just a, a day last summer, just a pretty standard day up there. We're lucky. It's It's got to be the best multi-species lake in the world, you know, for, for bass and walleye. And we've got like a pretty good lake trout fishery, uh, crappies, obviously pike and muskie. So there's always something biting every day of the year. And um and, you know, um, there's always multiple seasons open, so you can always fish for something like that's what's cool. Uh, some places have like a full on, you know, all the fish get a break for a month or two. And uh, we're, we're lucky like we uh, our bass seasons open year round. It's catch and release in the spring until July 1st. So there's no tournaments early, which is, you know, that's good. Um, we get to go and at least catch a bunch. The fishing is 
at ice out, I think that's the best fishing of the year up anywhere up north for smallmouth. I mean, they don't eat a lot during the winter, so they're ready to get it, get it after it. And uh, they're usually grouped up pretty good. So you, that's those are the days where you can go and catch like over 100. Absolutely. Now, have you, you grew up near Lake of the Woods your whole life? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, like pretty much um, in Kenora, right on the north end of the lake. And uh, my my grandparents and then my parents, we had a family cabin out on the lake. So that's sort of where I spent my summers and had access to fishing in the lake. And that's definitely how I kind of got uh, got the bug and and just, you know, it's sort of been my whole life just pursuing the fishing um the fishing career i went to i went to university after high school kind of on the keep mum happy program wasn't really sure what i wanted to do and um looking back now i i wish i would have taken like business or marketing stuff but i i took uh i was a geography major and a history minor i was like picking courses that i could you know if i missed some classes because i was fishing i could go you know roll through the textbook and um and know what i needed to know but yeah hey. the, the process was good i mean i got i got into doing a bunch of writing you know like right out of university and i still do quite a bit today just as a means to like not have to get a real job to go along with some of the tournament fishing and guiding and photo photography just um i've kind of done it all so i've never never really had to um have a have a real a real boss or a real job i've got uh i've got plenty of bosses with all my sponsor stuff and everything but um but i get to do my thing and i'm pretty lucky you got a wife you got a boss yeah you're, good call good call yeah, absolutely but no hey i understand that i think uh geography geology was one of my three majors i declared in one of my three different schools i went to to a yeah. mother right uh yeah. But at the end of the day, uh, I learned that what we learn the most is spending time in nature and on the water and outdoors. Yeah, no, and that's, uh, yeah, that's how it's been for me. And then obviously, like, I've, I've done a lot of hunting, guiding and outfitting too. Um, like, like I just like being outside, but for sure, fishing is uh, my, my, my favorite thing. And um, I always, I can always find something to go catch and, and be happy. And then got into the bass tournament stuff at a pretty young age and like, that's definitely like where my where the most passion is, I think, and what I like. I have to bug competitive bugs. So just like any tournament I can get into, I'm I'm down. And last week, uh this event at Lake Lanier was a no no live scope, no practice, no waypoints. Like it was a different format. It was kind of scary um a little bit. I've fished on Lanier a fair now a fair amount over the years. So I had like um areas that i knew uh i'd probably be able to run into some fish and it ended up working out but it was it was a lot of fun uh it was different um everybody was in a good mood and like it was just kind of a fun fun crew so i'm glad i went and fished and i ended up coming out of there with a eight place and got it didn't cost me any money so yeah i think a lot of eyes were on that tournament this weekend although not a whole lot of advertising not a whole lot of buzz the concept itself of no scope, no 360, I think drew a lot of people, you know, for sure. Yeah. And like, the, it's funny because like, I, I really don't think the results will change if you take it away. Like, I mean, obviously some of these guys are really experts with it, but all I know is we all have it on our boats and it's, it's not that hard to go and do it. It's just the hard part is committing to it and, and, you know, where I struggle maybe and I where I see I think other people struggle is like some of these guys are just only getting six or eight bites in a day and they're committed to hunting with that thing and it's it's yep. lethal. And uh, you know, that's where committing to it in the and and I mean we might see it again here at Harris Chain this week. It's it's been pretty it's pretty tough fishing and I'm yeah. gonna mostly fish shallow and and old school and but I mean I know there'll be some opportunities with guys out scoping around too and um you know I don't think it's gonna be a full on like how those Texas tournaments were at the start of the year where that was like if you weren't doing that you were you probably didn't stand a chance but uh yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see but I I decided a while back that I'm not going to complain or be a crybaby. It's just, it is what it is. And I'm going to, I just got to get better with it. And like, 
you can't no one can tell me it's more fun to go fishing and not have that on your boat like what it's super fun to watch fish how they interact with your bait and like to see if there's any on on the spot you're fishing like it's fun to use it but um yeah. i get uh you know it it maybe like draws you away from fishing with top water baits or swim jigs or stuff that's kind of fun you know the the uh the doing the casting stuff along the bank as well before before we transition to talking about spring open water fishing here when it is so cold um you, you talked about having multiple bosses with the sponsors and stuff you know so my question is because you said you wanted to do advertising or marketing in school you wish you could have gone back what is what is some of the insight of the business side of fishing you know some of the side people don't see because everyone sees the tournament, everyone sees the weigh-ins, but there's a lot of stuff going on behind the doors. Yeah, um, obviously, like, I get a lot of messages from people on social media, like, hey, can you introduce me to your guy at Northland? Or, or you know, um, do you think I fish such and such tournaments? I'd like, you know, I'd love, I use Shimano Reels. Do you think they'd sponsor me? And, like, that part of it's tough because it's it's everybody's budgets are, like, are hammered um you know you you really have to stand out now to if, especially like starting out and it's hard for the for the new guys for sure um you know it's uh it's it, the expectations from everybody are a lot higher than they were you know five even five years ago i think and um it's the whole package of of you know doing interviews like this, doing, um, you know, social media is obviously a huge component now for everybody. Um, the tournament stuff is important because it, you get credibility from fishing at a high level and qualifying sure. to fish at a high level and all that. Um, but the tournament results are not as important as they probably used to be. Like a lot of the other stuff's more important. Um, sure. I don't, I don't really do a lot on YouTube myself, but I do, um you know whether it's with you know over the years i've actually done a lot of video stuff with midwest outdoors but um okay. but it's you know it's it's wired to fish it's um you know a, a lot of my different sponsors creating content for their youtube channels it's uh you know there's a lot of different media um organ you know media people at our events and um so I I make an effort to like get out with those guys and and get a lot of content out that way. Um, but but yeah, I'm constantly like you don't have a lot of days off. I do a little bit of guiding, but I'm anymore. It's like I'm. It's probably um, I eat up more days, and it's probably more important for me to like put in the the days, whether it's for Lund or Northland or whoever it is, um, to to be doing stuff for working for those guys. And how much did that world of sponsorships and and obligations change after you won the Bassmaster Classic? Um, I mean, it changed everything. Changed like for the better, for sure. Like I've gotten a lot of good opportunity from that. But like at the same time, when when you get paid a little bit more, with that comes more expectation and more obligation and. Um, you know, it's, it's good, but like, it's a lot, like it's been, the last year has been busy. It's flown by. I don't, you know, you don't get a lot of time to like go fun fishing with your friends or your parents or your, you know, your family. Um, so you, you know, it, there is a sacrifice on some of that stuff, but I, I mean, I have no complaints. Everything's good, but like, it's, there is definitely more pressure and stress, like just to, for me anyway, it's just the way I am to, to keep all the sponsor people happy. Cause uh, you know, I'm, I'm, um, fully a regular guy and didn't, you know, I didn't have, um, you know, a brand new boat and truck when I was, I don't think I had my first boat till I was 23 or 24 and same with a vehicle. I mean, it was, uh, it was always a grinder for me just being in the fishing community, but I always made enough money to pay my bills and like, you know all good but it uh it was it wasn't easy like starting out and you know just like anything um sometimes it's who you know and you catch breaks like for for me 
I had had a friend from Minnesota that I'd guided several times and he, he basically supported me and covered my entry fees. The first couple of years I fished the FLW tour. And, uh, you know, without that, I probably never, I, I doubt I ever would have like taken the jump to go and, and do it. So, yeah. um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to get into and it's expensive to travel around and fish tournaments, but uh, if you love it, you, you know, no matter what your background is, you can, you, you know, there's a way, um, and, uh, it, you know, the, the most important thing, like for the tournament, if you're interested in tournament fishing and guiding too, for a career is like, you got to be able to catch fish. And that's the best thing you can do is spend time on the water, like be on the water all the time. And that's, and don't just go fish places where, you know, you can catch them, like fish different places and different conditions. And don't just go on the nice days, like all that stuff. Cause like if, when you go out on tour, like you're not, you're, you know, you're not going to get to fish the community holes probably in the tournament. They're all going to be bashed in and, people will be sitting on them. You gotta, and you know, you're, you gotta go no matter what the weather is. So it's, uh, that's, that's the, the biggest thing that I think is important, you know, and after that, you know, then the, all the, the social media and the, the sponsor stuff, you know, kind of comes, follows it in line. But I think you get a lot, if you can make it on the tournament scene and, and have some success, you get a lot of credibility there at least. And that gets your foot in the door to, to have some opportunities. Yeah. I mean, now we're looking at you in a beautiful Airbnb, I would assume in Florida somewhere. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of nights camped out in the truck or in a tent. Oh yeah. I've slept in my truck before for sure. Um, a bunch of times and, uh, yeah, no, my wife, my wife, uh, travels with me now. So, uh, we actually stay with Jason Christie and his wife, Shanna. So, uh, we, the girls, um, you know, we, the girls pick nicer places than Jason and I probably would, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's different. Sometimes it's like, anything if you can just find a place at some of the spots we go you're you're you know it's good um and then other times you got good options and some places are more expensive than others like we got a pretty nice place here this week and it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't the most expensive place we'll we'll be at all year for sure but uh but yeah no the girls um definitely uh we're staying in like a little bit nicer places than we we might otherwise i can only recall some of the places i've stayed yeah. oh yeah i've been there like yeah some bad bad places i've been to like and actually shelby was with me for this one a couple years ago we were we actually were in a little like hut that had a um a dirt floor it was no i i was in the bad book for a week after that one um and there was like nothing we couldn't find anything else around there and it was uh uh a matt robertson recommendation this place oh, that there you go. yeah that's what you get that's what you get from a matt robertson right? <laughs> so real quick um let's let's help the viewers here in the midwest yeah. um if we got ice out right pretty much ice out from kentucky up to lake of the woods now yeah. um so if we're in the north woods the border of canada you know northern Wisconsin, Northern Michigan, um, Northern Minnesota. What are some techniques and what are some areas you're looking for in that cold, high 30, low 40 degree water temps right now? Talking bass? Yeah, let's let's go bass, yeah. So, I mean, and I do a little bit of everything. And the fishing at ISO is good for whatever, you know, seasons are open wherever you live. Uh, we, we our walleye stuff's usually shut down until into may but bass um i would i used to get my boat in the water wherever i could like there'd be ice on the main lake stuff still and two things happen up up you know in those northern natural lakes that that i sort of have seen over the years where a warm water wherever you can find the warmest water in the back of the shallow bays like where they're going to spawn there'll always be fish pushed back into that stuff and then around any cover you know uh, rock, uh, lay downs, old, some of the old pencil reeds, you know, they're, they're, they're not green and growing up yet. They're, they're clumpy and sort of dead, but they hold heat. And, um, that's, that's what attracts the fish and the bait. The other thing, 
Um, and people might not realize this. This is something I learned all the years going to Sturgeon Bay, fishing the, the Sturgeon Bay Open is wherever that, you know, unless it's like a hurricane, then it's different. But wherever that, if you, when you're out fishing and you just have like a little bit of wind, yeah. normal amount of on a windy day, um, the bays and the coves where that wind's pushing into, that's where you're going to find the warmest water. All that warm surface water pushes into the, into those nooks and bays and, that's where you're going to find the best fishing. Like that's the easiest way to go out. If you're going to a place where you haven't fished before, if you're going to Sturgeon Bay, you know, in the next month, um, wherever that wind is blowing and it's crazy. You could go in one side. I've seen it so many times there, one side, a little Sturgeon where the wind's blowing in and catch a hundred bass and have the best day of your life. And if it switches direction the next day, you will not catch a single fish where you caught them the day before. And, um, and then it's just find them again. Um, they're going to be there. They're going to be biting somewhere. Uh, and that's kind of how it is. Most places I think fishing's good as far as baits go. Oh, and then the other thing that happens is at least up North, we'll get a, a population of fish that kind of hang out around the wintering holes for a week or two out deep and, and really grouped up, schooled up, easy to find with your electronics. Um, and those are kind of like still on the minnow eating program, the shallow ones I'm, you know, then you're, you know, crayfish and they're they're up there ready to eat whatever you can get yeah. from really i think but uh um, yeah that blade bait bite that blade bait bite in that real cold water can be really cool yeah you'll always yeah that is, is till the water gets you know up to the late the high 40s you you can always still find some that are going to be out in deeper water and and you know if you're if you're if you got some new electronics to share anything on your boat, it's a good place to go out and play around with them and get some catch some fish with them. Well, Gus, hey, I know you got a tournament. You got to get in the head space and everything. So good luck. Um, yeah. Yeah. Win a nice little check this weekend down in Florida. Two tournaments in a row in Florida, right? Coming up. Yeah, we're here this week. Uh, and then next week we go up to the St. John's River. So we're back to back in Florida. It's a little different. I mean, we've I fished down here many times, uh, but it's always been in January, February, maybe a few tournaments in March. So it's a little different. Um, I think all the spawning's pretty well done. I, I say that and then someone will have 35 pounds off beds tomorrow, but I think the spawn is kind of done. There's a lot of fry up shallow, you know, around, but, uh, uh, yeah, it should, it's, um, the, the, the fishing's a little tough, uh, just cause I, you know, this place needs some grass to grow back. It's hurting for grass and the water is just, the fishing just is, uh, is tougher than it has been on other trips here, but, uh. But yeah, I'm excited to get after it and catch some big fish. Awesome. Well, hey, I see there's some sun out and it's blowing 40. So tell Jason to grab his favorite spinner bait and you guys go hit some ponds and go yeah. catch a pounder today. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good call. We should. There's a there's a pretty nice one just down the block from our place, but we haven't. Uh, and it's like a little bigger than a normal pond. Like for, it has lily pads all around it, like guaranteed it's got fish in it. But we haven't really found a. We were, we were thinking maybe like right when the rain was coming down a while ago, it would have been good to go sneak through somebody's yard. It looks like it's going to be maybe a tough one to, you know, we're going to have to trespass probably to get it, get a line in the water, but we'll, uh, Listen, you know, just find, just find a boat in a driveway or some fishing stickers on a car in the driveway, knock on their door. Chance yeah. They might know. You, you walk. Yeah. They'll recognize Jason for sure. Yeah, he's you been know. Yeah. For me, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. Well, Hey Gus, thank you for joining. And um, thanks for all the, the time watching and being a part of Midwest outdoors over the years. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, it's been, been good. And I'm a big fan. So keep up the good work guys. Appreciate it. Well, everyone, right. that is Jeff Gustafson, a.k.a. Gussie, and we will see you on the water this year in the Bassmaster Elite Series. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com.
What is going on, everyone? And welcome to another podcast here at the beautiful Giant Goose Ranch. But this time, we have none other than Chris Grow. Chris, what's going on today, buddy? It's aching, bud. How you doing? Well, you know, I'm doing pretty well after we just got off the water. Yeah, a little rain coming, but we, we managed to have an okay morning so far, but we got a lot of time left. Oh, we got plenty of time. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of today's show, guys, how me and Chris did. But so far, Chris has got like a six pounder in the well. Yeah, it was a good, good morning. I got a couple two and a half, so we're building a little bag. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. And now we're taking a podcast break. Heck yeah, and a little rain break, a little food break, bunch needed. So Doing what we need to do. You know it. Recharge, refuel. So Christopher Grow, if anyone that does not know this man, all right, you should, first of all. He is from northern Illinois, and he grew up on the chain of lakes learning how to fish up there. Mm-hmm. And you got to fish the holy grail. You got to go fish pro be a pro fisherman yeah no that was uh that was an awesome awesome moment in time in my life the Bassmaster elites I could uh I'd love to get it back one day but uh it'll always be deep 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 in my heart it was awesome met some great people being on the road it was uh it's really hard to fully describe but it was a cool feeling well we'll try to describe a few of those feelings in a minute but let's start at the beginning all right yes sir so Where'd you grow up? Who influenced you on the fishing? Give me a little background. From the Fox Channel Lake, so basically born and red, raised uh, chain rat all day long. Um, the place isn't the greatest fishing, wasn't the greatest fishing. I mean, it's getting better and better uh, just due to you know, resources and us taking care of the place. But when it began, it wasn't the best. Uh, I basically got into fishing through my father a little bit, but mostly my grandpas, both my grandparents really got me involved. And then it escalated into me working at one of the local tackle stores, Triangle Sports and Marine, owned by Greg Dixon. And he's basically my second father. He's the man. And I don't know, if you were to be like a a boxer or a fighter or something, I was trained in that facility, Triangle Sports. I mean, anywhere from, you know, like, you know, casting contests in between work, uh, learning how to be ambidextrous as an angler. I mean, I, I can remember stupid stories. Like, he's like, you gotta learn to fish lefty. And you know, the, the marquee would have the reels up there, yep. you know, like where the handles, you yeah. know, they can display and touch them. He gives me this beat up old lefty and says, put this by the bathroom. Every time you're in there, just goose wind on it just to get yourself used to it. And it paid off because I fished fully, fully, fully ambidextrous. So the place was awesome. It was a breeding ground for tournament anglers and bass fishing alone. So basically a combination of the fox chain, making yourself a grinder and making it not so easy to catch bass and having the tournament environment and fishing environment of Triangle Sports Marine around me kind of put it in my blood fully. (laughs) Well, I love that. I think everyone has that, the mentor and then the bait shop mentor, right? Like every young kid, I have one, you, you go into this tackle store and they start telling you things and you go back because something works. Oh, yeah. And then before you know it, you're learning. So and then much. they tell you a lot of good stories, too. I Great think, stories. Too, so. Great you know, stories. But, uh, yeah, no, you can't take those days back. And it's, I feel like every kid should have that, like a little, if they're into fishing, you know, have that tackle store that they feel welcome to go in and ask questions. So instead of ordering this week maybe online which support your online dealers but go into an actual tackle store you know 100%. share some stories look at some pictures look at the taxidermy on the walls oh, yeah. some of the old memories are priceless and a lot of these places have old bragging boards with old polaroids and yep. that's that's yep. that's cheese right there that's good so when was your do you remember your first tournament yeah yeah i remember how it completely went down my first real tournament we're not going to count a wednesday nighter because i used to show up at when we've always had wednesday nighters and i used to show up there and hope someone didn't have a partner and then Love slide that. in and i actually slid in with like two of the best uh one is gone tommy seipold but it was an amazing day um i remember catching one on a motor oil seven inch berkeley power worm I, yeah 14 and a quarter inch i was pumped but um and then i got to fish with another legendary rat kovacek but those are just good times good times first real tournament was cool because i was working at the shop and you know i'm seeing a lot of tournament anglers and kim drayton come in and he's just like if you want to fish tournament i need a sub 
I'm like, oh, 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 okay, okay. I'm like, I don't have money for the entry fee. He's got a brand new Stratus, you know, at the time, like blue with a pearl pin through it. Awesome. Shimmering. Shimmering. I need you to wax my boat. You wax the boat and get the boat all cleaned up, I'll pay your entry fee. So long story short, went in there and I think we blanked though. Nice. <laughs> but it was awesome though, just, you know what I mean? I just, I had to go. And then ever since then, and those couple Wednesday nights I did, I was hooked and uh, I was fortunate to be at the shop and be a decent angler to have a couple guys be like, hey, you want to fish? And took me under their wing and then I fished a couple of the divisions. And I mean, I made my first Northland Classic at 16, so that was pretty early, so. Absolutely. So you did that for a while. You, you started mastering the chain yeah. and- Yep, yeah. ran a little guide service then too. I mean, I guide now, but I ran one when I was young, yeah. thinking I was, uh, you know, a hot stick or whatever. And it was awesome. I took out a lot of people, but yeah, that's kind of where that went. And then we uh, decided to build a business and try to, Built a few houses. I went to school and all that, and I just my love was just fishing, 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 and then uh, it was just a trickle effect after that. Yeah, I think I can relate to that a little bit. I think yeah, I think more kids need to do that. More. <laughs> this is one of our slogans here on this: okay. get them off the Xboxes and into the tackle boxes. That's awesome. We That's love awesome. it, right? Yeah. So you you fish these tournaments and. Tell me if I'm wrong, but is there any, is there many more places that are more humbling to tournament fish or just fish in general than the chain? Yeah, you're right. Very humbling. I mean, there is no set pattern. It is a junk fishing mecca. I mean, you can set, set up a pattern once in a while in the spring and the fall, but it's junk fishing and it's a lot of heartbreak. You know, you could be one weekend the man and get a top three and then the next weekend come in with two bass. So very humbling, but I like that, you, you know. I like bodies of water like that. It teaches you to grind, it teaches you to stay focused, and you learn a lot more. So. Absolutely. So speaking of learning, then you took a huge learning curve, right? So when did you when did you start trying to qualify for the opens, and how how long? You mean the leads, you mean? Well, how long what, did you start fishing the opens to qualify? Okay. Yeah. I yeah. I, oh, beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I had a little bit of a trip. See, I, I fished a ton, you know, around the chain, like you said. Mm -hmm. Then I started spreading myself out, fishing some major team events, getting south, getting up north, getting my name out there. But yeah. then I'm like, this, you know, there's got to be a time because I was in my 30s. I'm like, I gotta get, I gotta give it a shot. You sure. Know? So it was always here, always here. But I was working, family, life. You know, it always, you always, oh, next year, next year. Well, I kind of had a major tragedy. I lost my old man, and. Uh, Lost my dad and they kind of, uh, I was running a company and I was, I was happy, I was making good money, but I wasn't fully happy. And that kind of, I don't know, you lose someone, you kind of dig deep and try to do some things. So I'm like, let's go, let's go try to do the opens. And this was back when you qualify uh, per division, it would be three tournaments and then they take the top five. Now it's, you have to fish all nine. Um, so I went, I actually did the Southerns. Just did one division, it was right after my dad died. Heart of winter, had first one was at Harris Chain in like the end of January, then Smith, and then I believe uh, my mom, um, Douglas in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So long story short, I went out there really free. I wish I still fished like that a little bit more, um, but I went out real free, you know, with a lot, we had a heavy heart going, a lot of thinking and by the end of the tournament season, three tournaments, Douglas, I finished seventh and I just missed making the elites. And it was just like, whoa, I can do this. Wow. So, you know, we're on a podcast. Let's hit fast forward. That just laid it into me. You know, I had, I cashed a check in all three of them, just missed the elites. It's when Wheeler qualified, Mark Daniels Jr., Mark Rhodes, like all these dudes. I'm like, this is what I want to do. So the next year I strate strategically planned out my work schedule with, uh, I had a tile business going, got as much help as I could from friends and family, picked up a handful of sponsors, mostly local that generated some things and helped me. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I did what everyone's doing now. I went and I fished all three divisions, central, northerns, and the southerns. Not for the reason of what they're doing now, right. but I wanted to give myself three shots to qualify for the sure. elites. And uh, it was a long road. I learned a ton about traveling, um, maintenance on your boat and truck, like a lot of, lot of cool things and a lot of bad things. So be it. 
uh, the Northern Division was the best one for me, um, and I finished fifth. Uh, and uh, that was history, and I made the elites. And that division, I believe, I had, uh, I think Oneida was in there. I think it's kind of weird. I think I ended at Douglas again. Interesting. And I actually fished in, uh, you can use a different boat if you started with it. I fished in an aluminum boat with a 30 in that really? one to qualify for the elites. Because I, I, I went out there not even thinking about qualifications. I thought about winning. Brought my dog with me, which was really cool. My boy here on my arm, you know, he brought him with. And uh, it was cool. It was just a cool situation to do that. And actually, a couple rats came with and fished as co-anglers and pros. So I, our house was giddy up on fire when, when, awesome. when that final day came in and uh, I made the, you know, made the elites. So basically, I gave it two years on the opens. And uh, you did. I made it. Yeah. So I was happy. So let's let's stop time for a second. OK. We I just, wish I could stop it at that point because yeah. I would have done things differently. But let's keep going. <laughs> we just qualified for the elites. Oh, yeah. We're celebrating. What's the first thought that goes to the brain? The first thought? Or you want reality? I, don't, I, don't, I mean, you, you know, we, we have a PG show here. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's, let, yeah, no, we're, when I said we tore it up and partied, that's past the PG and that was fun, but it had to get serious when it was coming time to seeing the $57,000 in entry fees you had to come up 57, with. 57000 And that's where reality kicked in. Um, I needed to find other sponsors, and here was the main reality. You know, I've been watching Fast Fishing since it was on TV, and Everyone thinks that this is the most glamorous and you're there, you're in. The only way you can see I'm there and I'm in is if I'm Greg Hackney, KVD, Rick Clun, when it's, when sponsors are easy. Yep. Um, I still grind for sponsors now. Um, it's difficult, but let me tell you right now, my head was this big. I thought I had it. I thought I can go to any company I want and get in. Heck no. My rookie year, we came up with $23,000. So the rest- 35,000. Yeah, I had to come out of my pocket, my mom's pocket. I mean, it was, we did everything we could, you know, and tried to, you know, I cashed a check in a couple of them, so that helped, but it wasn't all glitz and glamor. But that first year, like I told you a couple seconds ago, I wish I could have got it back. I would have done things a hair bit differently. I'll be honest, and I probably have never said this on any podcast, and, I've been on a lot and I've told this story quite a few times is, I'll be straight with you. I, I was, whatever, I was just under 40 years old. I wasn't ready. I, I knew I wasn't, because dude, I qualified so fast through the elites that like, I just wasn't completely financially ready. I wasn't mentally ready. That's why I wish I had that rookie year back. And you can see it as my progression and that's why I'm still not, I'm not in the elites anymore because I couldn't, they, they did some cutting and we're in to lower the numbers, and I was just right on the bubble, whatever, but I stopped, I stopped fishing the moment for a while there. I stopped being that natural angler that I was when I was in the opens. Yep. I did not care. I did not care at all, and that was key, and you hear it from a lot of anglers and good friends of mine, you know, fighter and those type guys, you know, you, you need to not care, and it's not the not caring, like, I don't care, man. It's the you know, oh my God, I just dumped a five. There's gonna be one more around the corner. So those are little tips and tricks I hope you young kids can take from it. Just slow down and remember where you came from. I started trying to force things that weren't my strengths and we learned it and we got the learning curve down and made some checks and had some highlights, but I'd love to get it back, but I'll never, it's a double-edged sword. It's like, I'd love to get it back, but I loved what I had, you know? I met so many people, I learned so much, and, and it's always something that will be, I will never be able to say, you know what I mean? I'll always be in a Bassmaster Elite Angler. It's different, I think, for the average fisherman that might be listening to this, right? Someone that goes out and every day is not a day in the office or having fun. This tournament mindset, and I only have a little bit, right? I only have a taste of it. Okay. But it can make people puke before a tournament. 100%. Speaking from. Yeah. It can make people act like your buddy, you don't know him all of a sudden, the way he you know, is talking yeah. or acting. Yeah. Um, this ter competition, right? Yeah. It, it brings out difference Very in everyone. So. And it clouds your judgment. Yeah. Like wh when you launch, I don't think people think about it. They're going out on a day on the lake. But for a tournament guy, you might rethink 
that decision a hundred times because if you go to one spot over the one spot, your whole day changes. Am I running 40 miles or staying by the ramp, you know? And then you come in and here they busted them by the ramp. You know, there's such a mental game. That's why it's so comparable to golf and stuff. Just that the, you can really, you know what I mean? You knock one off, you top a ball on, on the third hole and you got, uh, you got 15 more to go. You could really screw your day up. So it's very comparable, you know? And it's all numbers, right? Every cast we take, yep. truly. Every cast we take could result in our PB, your fifth fish in a tournament, or a world record, possibly. 100%, 100%. You need to be confident with every swing of the bat. So let's talk a little bit about more of the fun, right? So you're not where you want to be right now, but that's a matter. You're doing awesome things. You're fishing. What are you fishing right I'm now? Fishing the where I think uh, I think Boyd's got it at the Tackle Warehouse Invitationals now. So you have to feel proud that you got invited now. Doing that. It's fun, it's okay, uh, it's a filler. I just, I would love to get back in the opens, but I don't have time for nine right now, you know? I wanna do some work on the house, I, run, I got a business to run, just opened up Chain Rats Guide Service, so there's a lot of things that I'm trying to, you know, use to pay the bills and uh, stack some money so I can retire and live at a beautiful place like this and fish every day, but, um, the Tackle Warehouse Invitational is where I'm at. Been there now two years, and I'm happy with it because it's just a little low key, but the payouts are good and all that. Yeah. But uh, I got some decisions to make. You know, whether I'm going to move on and go forth with it this year. I mean, I'm I'm 92 and a half percent sure that I'm gonna. But it's just you're always thinking about you know, the number one thing, the money, the sponsors. Um, you know my future. I just want to, you know, brand myself and keep branding myself and keep the, you know, Chain Rats Guide Service going. But I got that competition in my blood. It's hard to shake it, boys. It's hard, hard to, shake. to shake. Hard to shake. Besides competition, okay. give me some of your best memories on the road. What do you got for me? Where are we going with it? Are we going to go, you want me to start at uh, me and Seth Fighter pulling over in East Texas into basically a zombie gas station? Or do we want uh, nights out with Chris and Corey? Um, I mean, I mean, we've got a lot in between. Where would you like me to go with this? Yeah, somewhere, uh, somewhere between fireworks and big bass. You know, so we so, somewhere that ties in. You know, those nights that are are a holiday and and the day on the water. You know, um, I know it's tough. You know, you got so many. Well, I'm going to throw two quick flares out, and it involves both the people that uh, I talked about here. Sure. Um, basically, a really cool moment, like, was, I'm not going to lie, and, you know, I became family with Gussie, Chris, Corey, uh, Maddie Robinson, Robertson at the end, and, of course, Seth, my best boy. But uh, when Chris won at uh, St. Lawrence, yeah. um, it was just epic because we had a back-to-back. And there were a lot of uh, sacred promises that, that were made uh, if he won. And uh, it was just cool to experience a friend winning at that level. I mean, he's won before, but we were, I mean, we waited up for him when he got to Champlain. It was just a good camaraderie of dudes all hugging and drinking beer and being around the trophy and then having to go to practice the next morning. It was just a cool it just made me want it more and want to win and want that blue trophy. So that was cool. But definitely as a quick token, we got to talk about the zombies. I mean, I ain't never seen anything like it. Trust me, I love Texas. I love East Texas. Lee Livesey, beautiful place, big bass, great country. But Seth was running out of gas and we pulled into a gas station that I've never seen anything like it before. Literally every gas pump had a car at it, not pumping gas people walking all over, looking like zombies, the people inside, like no one even working. I'm getting like white eyeballs from Seth as he's pumping gas, looking at me going, we need to get out. You know, like we need to go. And um, then all of a sudden a uh, school bus pulls up with the top cut off and a whole pile of like migrant workers walk out, like, like, like Mexican workers. I mean, nothing bad, but it was just a really spooky, spooky day. And just imagine that and the success of Chris winning that and everything in between. And like I said, we're keeping this PG, but keeping it PG. Lots of good stories.
I think anyone who enjoys fishing, especially watching bass fishermen, would love to be a fly on the wall for like everyone for a day of the year. Because I'm sure the list of stories from top to bottom. Dude, I have some I can't even. I told you guys one the other night that yeah. both of you floored on. I mean, there's ones I can't have to take to my grave. You know, just how it's going to be. But like I said, you are bass fishing superstars. All you really got as fans is no good looking women. You have got old men and kids. No big deal. You know, but it's hilarious. It's just like you come out from a gas station and you got kids all around. You're signing autographs. Then you got the creepy old man leaning on your boat looking at you. He's always there. That guy is weird. But I still <laughs> sign his crusty, sweaty hat. So, but and that's why they love you, Chris. No, and that, and that's why I love you guys because we all click here at Midwest Outdoors, and we have, we have a we have a good good time. The funny stories are there because a lot of the life on the road, right? Yes. Talk about life on the road, literally to the nitty gritty, because I don't think people understand. I've learned now. It, it changes kind of how much you're involved, right? How, how many sponsors they have, how big you are, you know, all yeah. that. But some of these guys are spending 300 Ooh. days on the road. Yes, and some of them are traveling basically. I mean, some of these guys have amazing wives or girlfriends that are driving a big rig, basically, RVs, 30 footers or, or, or tow behinds. I mean, I give them credit upon credit with the kid and the dogs in there and then you know the pros travel with the boat Absolutely. that is an amazing economical way if you have the money to put out right away right. then you got the guys that always stay in the beautiful hotels life is good you know no big deals you're scott martin's just everything's yeah when when daddy's rolling it helps you know then you got the mediocre guys we try to find the cheapest vrvo we can that does not have many roaches or scary spiders oh gosh that's another one joe i saw a spider at the james river me and matt stefan had to kill this thing in the bathroom at like four in the morning two men to kill one spider dude one spider the size of a hockey puck and as soon as we cracked it about 100 babies come out the back oh, it was just oh gosh oh we do not want to sleep there have you ever had to deal with the bed bugs uh, yes, but but going back to Seth Fighter, he is the best bed bug checker in the world. I'll pull up in the front and wait for him. You know, we'll check in. Yep. We've had several times he come running out. Nope, we're gone. We're out of here. Get our money back. You guys got bed bugs. I hope you know that. We're out of here. And uh, yeah, that's happened twice. Yeah. So not naming the name of the hotel no, chain, no. but it was uh, it was interesting. But yeah, no. So you got us that are doing the mediocre BRVOs or staying with a friend. But then you got the guys who were sleeping in their trucks, tents. tents, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I go back this year, we're gonna try to continue my YouTube that I've neglected, and I'm gonna pull the whole Tundra Hotel, I am gonna cook wild game and, and video it, I am going cheaper than cheap can be and try to knock off four or five grand of my bill at the end of the year, and uh, maybe fish a little more free, go out there smelling a little bit more like Bigfoot and catch some bass. I think um, from someone who slept uh, over 100 nights in the truck, right? Um, I think that smell that you get is really fishy. You know, I don't think they like the perfumes and the dyes, oh, you know? Gosh. I mean, like, look at Caleb, Caleb Kufal from Northern Wisconsin. Boy, can crack him, and he loves sleeping in his truck. Hey, it's, you know, you get the right seat, it's comfy. Oh, yeah. I just, this is what I want to warn you about, okay? So you're sleeping, this is, it just happens, I think. You're sleeping, and you start hearing someone outside your window, okay? okay. The, this, the situation's a little awkward. And you turn, because you're about to meet eyes with them. Yeah. But then it's a deer looking at you. That's so that's all right. That's a little better. It's better. Way better. At least it's not, at least not the guy from the gas station. <laughs> so you've traveled all over. What is your favorite lake in the country? And what's your favorite Midwestern lake? Favorite lake in the country. It is a very, very hard one. So I got to kind of give you two. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll take it. I think everyone in the world is in love with the St. Lawrence River. Yes. I'm sorry. It is. Big, fat, smallmouth that just want to hurt you yep. is something magical. Yep. But as for like Bassin, Southern, like let's go, Smith Lake, baby. Big largemouth, big spots. Every time I go there, I do good. It's the only place I can say that I, every time I make a top 30. God bless. So them fish love me there. And, uh, yeah, I would love to retire there, but if you've seen the houses on there, I might have to tent it over a nice 
shale rock edge. <laughs> I have visited the nice Coleman, Alabama oh, before. There's a lot of money there. Between Martin, the Coosa River chain, weird. I mean. Weird, nothing in between, but then you get on the lake and you're looking at like million dollar cribs. Your average house is a single or a double wide, you know. Outside the water. And then you get on the water and, and like, wow. Nick Saban, Bear Bryant, and every rich person, you know, yep. Tommy Tuberville, everyone's house is yeah. on the water and there's tons of stuff. Yeah, and it's just such a beautiful place. Yeah. And it's weird. It's clean water. Yeah. I mean, it's only 38,000 acres, but it's like windy. It's, it's just a cool environment. Yeah. And, and the water looks really, I like that bluish, that, that water, clearish water. Now bring it up to us. Bring it to home. Home? What do you like in Illinois or Midwest? Anything around? What, what do you like? What, give me a couple if you want. Um, if I was to just go out and have to go... Fish. See, I can't give those lakes. Those lakes don't count. We got some sniper ones. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I, as much as people say I hate it, I love the chain. I mean, I make a ton of money off of it, but if I was to go anywhere around. You get to go anywhere in the Midwest, where are you going? Mississippi River. Mississippi River. I'm sorry. It's just. Too don't be long. sorry. Can't you know, be between, you know, pools. I mean, every pool is amazing, but seven, eight, nine, even getting into Winona. I mean, yeah, it's. I mean, what, you can do anything you want, you know? You can spook up big smallies, you can punch your big largies, frog all day. If you could take out the mudfish, the doggies, the dog. then I'd be happy. I'll deal with the pike, but yeah, that would probably be it, just because they're so much fun. You, you kind of mentioned it, there's so much to do on the Mississippi, yep. and the backwater, obviously. Yep. Do you have a favorite? Do you, I, I see the rod deck, guys. There's no, there's no wands out there. There's no, there's no fairy sticks, right? It's all the meat and potatoes. If I'm good with a, I'm good with a spinning pole. I just did, and when I came here, I just said soft. to myself, yeah, I just said, I don't want to do that. No, so. you want to crank on the big one. I like doing that. Yeah, yeah. who doesn't like cranking some big ones? By the way, guys, he has for multiple days in a row, just showing me up nonstop. My hand hurts. But that, ba places, that bass hand, you got that bass hand working yet? Oh yeah. Oof. It's fun and I smell like bass too. And I smell like a chigger craw, too. Ooh. You know, the chigger craw, we can talk about that. That one's wrapped in a silver hair of mine. Yeah, you get that silver fox? Yeah. Guys, this Save hair, have Save you seen this one. hair? It's the lovish locks. So the chigger craw, I, I, I will stop, stop and talk about this for a second. I was in high school, I think I was a junior in high school, and I watched a kid catch a 36-pound bag in Illinois yeah. on a public bike, lake, yeah. anchored by a 914. Oh, geez. And... You know what he's using? Chigger craw. Chigger craw. And it, something about it, it's just every kid at that tournament has just gone on their whole life and not stopped using a chigger craw. I have not either. Because you put it in your hands and you learn you don't have to see others catch fish on it. You can catch fish on it immediately. I mean, it's, it is a staple in, I mean, like the conversation we had the other night about just a couple baits that you're stuck with. That'd be definitely, need, you know, if I had to go out yes. with three packs of something, that yes. would be one of them. You can fish it Texas rig. You can fish it on a shaky head. You can fish the three inch on a Ned. You just scared me. Did you just bring Ned again, shaky head. Is this really happening right now? Listen, I'm a Chicago boy that has fished Lake Michigan, pressure, has fished pressure, Sturgeon pressure. Bay, has fished St. Clair. Just all day, yesterday. Where's my Ned rig? Scaring me, dude. I also love throwing big swim baits. He we teases know. me about that too. We so heard you lose one this morning. Then we, then we, there's one hanging up in a tree that's ninety dollars. Yeah, at least it wasn't the three hundred dollar one. Yeah, I hear you. Everyone wants. They love the stories, right? But everyone comes to Midwest Outdoors because we're gonna teach them something. Okay. So, let's talk about the chain. Your home body, right? Yeah. It changes every day. You can catch fish doing different yeah. stuff, yeah. but. Give, give some pointers to our audience. What's, what's some things they can look for, whether it's time of year, weather changes, moon phases, baits, areas, what, give, give them some juice. Not, you for the chain specifically, Let's if they came the out there and wanted to start fishing? If people want to fish the chain of lakes in Illinois. Uh, um, well, I'm gonna start with the three baits you should lock in your hands for all times of the year there. Okay. Um, definitely, it is a, since the, the gizzard shad have been introduced, there's also a lot of emerald chiners and whatnot. A spinner bait is key. I don't care if it's spring or 40 degree water in the fall. Spinner bait. Um, I'm gonna say it again, they love a green pumpkin chigger craw there. If for as many tournaments that go out, Wednesday nighters, Sundays, Saturdays, college, high school events, 
and they throw green pumpkin sugar across, they still eat it. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, to end it there, and mind you, I'm trying to give you baits that you can work all year long. Sure. Um, I would definitely, definitely get into some sort of square bell crankbait. Mm -hmm. um, it offers a lot. Um, in the middle of summer, it's a little harder to work because of the grass and stuff, but there's still a lot of areas that you can get it through. So those are three baits. And uh, my tip to you guys is if you're going to go to the Fox chain, basically split the lake in half. Those northern lakes are clearer, have more, a little bit more abundance of different vegetation. When you pick your day to go out on the water, either go north or go south. Don't mix it. It's really good to break the chain in two pieces. Um, it just, it, it really helps you get comfortable on your strengths because there are a lot of anglers that are amazing and cash checks every week, but they never go north or they never go south. Sure. So, you know, it's not like us local rats that are burning a whole tank of gas and fishing all 13 lakes in a day. It's a different story. But if you're getting here and you're coming here to have some fun, just pick a section area and kind of roll with that. So now are you trailering out of these lakes or yeah. they you connect, can, right? The yeah, chain you can connect through all of them. Yeah, you can connect them all. Unless you're going down river or whatnot, but that's during the summer months, you don't want to be down there. I mean, you can catch fish, but it's just a zoo. And that's not what you came out to deal with on the water is, is the, the, there is the, the chain comes with chaos. A lot of partying, a lot of uh, women in hardly any clothes, you know, a lot of water skiing, wakeboard boats, you name it, but it's still got a plethora of bass in it and some really nice smallmouth these days. I've seen nice bass out of it. I've seen nice perch, crappie, walleye, musky. Oh gosh, muskies. But the perch been on fire. The couple guides out there are just shocked at how big the perch have got. Yeah. And well, they're not giant, but they're right at that good eating size. So, so if people are looking for some early season perch before our Lake Michigan perch come to shore, maybe head out, check out the chain. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of guides you could pick up through that and uh, just hit me up. I can help you sort around through guides that are dealing with that stuff directly, so. And give me, you brought it up a few times, a chain rat, right? Yep. We, down on the Displains, Kankakee, we use the word river rats, right? Same thing. Yeah. So what does being a chain rat mean to you? Give me your definition of being a chain rat. Oh, a definition of a chain rat is basically hammers that are on the chain, but it turned, you know, like it was literally in the 80s and 90s, a group of guys that dominated in the tournament scene on the Fox chain, because the tournament scene on the Fox chain has been, it was way heavier back in the 90s than it even was now. More boats, more people, co-angler pro events. So you had that like stigmatism of these top three guys that whooped butt all the time. That's kind of moved forward, but I chose to just really brand it into majority of fishing, you know, chain rats, guys that grind it out there, rats, you know, always out fishing from sun up to sundown. But then over the time in my elite series career, it kind of spread out the hashtag and went into, you know, people boating, people walleye fishing. Everyone is branding the hashtag chain rats and it's just turned into its own entity. So you can take a little combination of each, but tried and true, if you're a rat, you are basically digging down in every little hole, flipping every dock, skipping every set of pads you can with a frog and fishing from sun up to sun down and making this place your own and learning a lot from it. And uh, there's been a handful of kids that have learned a lot from it and now are progressing to college angling and they are down home young rats. From everyone at Midwest Outdoors. Oh, look at this. And the giant goose ranch that has some of the best fishing in the Midwest, some of the best hospitality, and some of the best food. I'm Jim O'Neill. This is Chris Grow. And stay tuned after this quick commercial break, and we'll be right back to finalize this podcast that was a pleasure making. I appreciate you guys. Take care. Midwest Outdoors Magazine helps you enjoy the outdoors, giving you the best information on where to go, what to use, and how to use it. With fishing maps marked by the pros, nature notes, in-depth interviews, and much, much more. Your subscription gets you 10 big issues of the best in fishing, hunting, and the great outdoors. Plus, Midwest Outdoors Digital Edition gives you dozens of extra articles. Sign up now at MWOMag.com. That's MWOMag.com.
All right, so there you have it. Some awesome insight from two different anglers and a big thanks to both of them, especially Chris for sitting down in person with us. And you know, that was a few months back, but I'll be honest, sitting down and speaking candid about the whole process with someone who, you know, necessarily hasn't gotten all the highlights of the tour, but is your average guy, you know, who's down to earth, who has wanted to do this his whole life and has gotten the opportunity and isn't giving up on the dream, but maybe changing it a little bit. It's awesome to see. The life of a touring pro is not all glamorous, that's for sure, but if you're able to figure it out, it truly can be a storybook ending. Now, Chris is no snub. I fished against him for multiple days here and he kicked my butt each day. It was like any time I would set the hook, it was a two pounder, but when Chris set the hook, there could be a five or six pounder coming up. Now, I haven't figured out exactly how he's doing that, but that's the goal. Stay on the water and keep learning, keep practicing, and one day maybe you, or even me, will be as good as one of these pros. Now, before, before we go to the product review, I wanna show you guys a quick clip of what happened because we are finishing up our day and, well, it's not every day you see a muskie do something like this. Yeah, it is. Look at that muskie. What is it doing? That's a muskie, dude. <laughs> Do you see that thing? <laughs> he was he's on it. Oh, he's on it. I got him. He caught. He ate it. He ate it. I got him. He doesn't know he's hooked, dude. Dude, he came back for it. Look at the size of this one. It's a oh, pike, dude. Giant pike. Dude. Oh. <laughs> Let him I've run. never Let caught him one run. that big. Let him run. Guys, that was epic right there. This pike was literally like doing He's some bizarre. Side. He's on the doing some bizarre head. They do that. I've heard them doing that. Yep. It looks like a gator. You could see just the eyeballs and the teeth out of the water. Dude, this is probably the biggest pike I've ever caught. I've caught some big muskies, but look at the size of this thing. Oh my it's a 45 God. inch pike. Dude. Oh my gosh. I don't know, dude. It's a hybrid. It's a muskie. It's a tiger? Yeah, it's a tiger. It just looked like it. Beautiful fish, though. Beautiful. That was so cool, dude. I couldn't believe he turned on it and ate it. Oh, he turned and smoked it, dude. Dude, he's like, screw you. No, no, no. He's got a lot more in him. Dude. I know. I just know he's gonna come over here and not be happy. All right. There you go. Hell yeah, dude. Watch that hook. Let me get it out first. <laughs> Look at this snoot hook, dude. Barely. Barely. One hook. One hook in him. Dude. Guys, not only does Chris beat me, but he catches a fish of an absolute lifetime. Chris, I caught my PB Tiger Muskie this year. Is this yours? Close, I don't got a tape on it, but it's close. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's close, but I don't care. For Illinois, this is a bad mamma jamma here. Guy catches big bass and big muskie. Let's get the release on this. We had an incredible day. So although we didn't show an official weigh-in, no surprise, Chris won. And if it was even up to debate, I think when you catch a true magnificent fish like that, over 40 inch tiger muskie, which right now I'm getting one ready for the wall, one that looked like that, fish of a lifetime, I think Chris even might've said that it was his biggest tiger ever. And it was just such a cool experience. Uh, it's something I'm gonna remember for a while and I hope you do too, Chris. Um, so hey, thank you for that day on the water. Now. Speaking of catching big fish, you know what that takes? It takes good baits. And I wanna take a minute to talk to you guys about the product review this week. Limit Out Baits, right out of Wisconsin. They are making some really cool soft plastic baits here. And I've got a line of them from drop shot baits, Ned Rigs, Sankos, you know, they've got a bunch of different style baits. And the coolest thing about this is not only the unique uh, scent they have on them, but they're all hand poured. So they're extra soft with good durability and it's a little more unique. You get some more color options like this brown, red flake, orange, black flake laminate. That's a really cool one. And they also have some unique crayfish. These are super realistic looking. Let me show you guys these real quick. Super realistic looking. Two-tone, laminate, purple on the bottom, green pumpkin on the top. Um, with that garlic smell, it's really gonna help attract fish. So guys, if you're looking 
for an awesome bait to try out this year, always we're going to recommend to try out the new Fish Daddy lineup, which by the way, we're going to dive into next episode. But also, check out some of our local companies, especially Limit Out Baits, because hey, that looks like it's going to catch a big smallie to me. I don't know about you guys. So tie one on, try it out. All available at LimitOutBaits.com. So check them out, guys, and uh, hopefully you won't be disappointed. Hey, I want to thank everyone for joining us this week. We had an action-packed, awesome episodes with some great hosts. Again, a special thanks to both of our guests for joining us this week. And hey, if you guys aren't bat, big bass fishermen or, or tournament followers, I hope we gave you a little insight on that world and scratched that itch a little bit. And for you bass heads, I hope you enjoyed this episode a lot. Now, hey, real quick, those product reviews we just went over, these Limit Out Baits, we're gonna be giving a bunch of these to one lucky fan this week. So if you guys liked this episode, all you have to do is comment your favorite bass angler in the comments and you could be a winner of a prize package from Limit Out Baits. So from everyone from Midwest Outdoors and Fish Daddy, I'm Jim O'Neill, and we will see you guys next time, Midwest Outdoors Podcast.